All right. Well, welcome everyone to our Ability Ministry Indispensable Leader Gathering here on May 28th. Uh, our topic for today is partnering with parents. And our special guest to help lead that uh, discussion is Wendy Wilkin from Traders Point uh, Christian Church in Indianapolis, just outside of Indianapolis, right? All right. So, so yeah, so cool. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Just a couple uh, reminders. We have a couple different purposes for our gatherings. One is just to have fun. Uh, we all feel the fatigue of doing this Zoom thing. So we try to do something out of the ordinary and fun each time we gather. Uh, another one of our purposes is inspiration um, to help inspire you to give you uh, be what you need to kind of keep keep pushing forward uh, through these difficult times. Uh, we like to give you information uh, to equip you to be able to do ministry effectively. And the fourth thing that we like to do is just to create a forum uh, for you to network with each other and to learn from each other. So we'll be doing all of that today. So uh, let's get into our game. Let's have a little bit of fun. Uh, the winner of our game is going to get a five-pack of our My Friends, My Teachers, uh, Life Encounter, uh, Life Changing Encounters uh, with Disabilities. This is our small group study book. Uh, so the winner uh, will get that. Let me tell you how we're going to do this. So if you open up your chat uh, section here, I have 11 uh, different nursery rhymes or poems or something that you would have had to have learned uh, maybe as a parent or heard as a child from your parent. Um, and I'm going to show you those nursery rhymes uh, by showing you a handful of emojis. All right, so you have to figure out what the nursery rhyme is by looking at the emojis and typing it in the chat section. First person to get it right gets a point. Person with the most points, uh, at the end, we'll win the five pack of our My Friends, My Teachers books, and we'll kick those out in the mail to you. All right. If you are ready, uh, give me a thumbs up. All right. You ready for this? Okay. You want to win? And I apologize with between between the light and my, my uh, phone here, there may be a little bit of glare, but uh, uh, Jason is going to try to keep a, a tally of of points on who's winning here uh, in the chat section. So here we go. Here is your first nursery rhyme. First person to type it in uh, to the chat and get it correctly will get the first point. All right, we got Tim Bussey with point number one, one, two, a buckle my shoe. Good job shoe. there. <laughs> show. <laughs> Once you buckle my show, <laughs> we'll give you the point anyway. Okay. All right. And we figured since our topic today is partnering with parents, an important tool all parents need in their toolbox is those nursery rhymes. So there's late night crying sessions or whatever you use nursery rhymes for. All right. Your second one, uh, probably the creepiest one that I've got for you. Three blind mice? No, no. Let me get a little closer. Oh. Rub a dub dub. A three <laughs> men in a tub. Wendy, very good. Like, seriously, if you're doing that nursery rhyme with your kids, like, what are you teaching them? What's wrong with you? That's <laughs> so creepy. All right. All right. Next one. All right. Here we go. This one should be an easy one. My mice for Allison. Wow, quick on the draw there. All right, so we got one point across the board with Wendy, Tim, and Allison. Uh, next one. Rain, rain, go away. I think Allison's got that one. Just barely beat Tim on that. All right, so Allison. Allison's got two points. Okay, here we go. Here's the next one. A lot of studying. 
<laughs> a lot of study and not much typing. I thought this one would be an easy one. All right, do you guys give up? Farmer in the Dell? No, no. How about Old McDonald? Old McDonald, he's the farmer, and on his farm he had a cow. Na, 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 na. Right? Uh, uh, all right, no points, no points. Okay, here's the next one. Saying more. <laughs> Carrot, you're hilarious. All right, who's going to get it? Who's going to get it? I do see some typing. The mice, the mouse ran up the clock. Tim, all right, second point for Tim. Very good. All right, we got a couple other people joining us here. All right, thanks for joining us. We're doing a little uh, nursery rhyme emoji guessing game. So if you wanna jump in the chat, go ahead and open up your chat and uh, we'll see who has the most points here when we're done. Uh, <laughs> Ryan will be singing the next curriculum series. That will never happen. Thanks, Garrett. <laughs> you don't want that. Okay, here's the next one, all right. Monkeys jumping up on down on the bed. Five little monkeys. Yes. Good job, Allison. So where are we at points wise? Uh, Jason, we got Allison, you have three. Is that right? Or four? Three? Do you, do you want me to start with the, the last just so we can mention? So Garrett has zero points. <laughs> oh, a little trash talk. Um, <laughs> Listen, this is not my strength. Okay, just stop judging me. I need my wife and kids here for this game. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think we've got Allison. Uh, Allison with uh, three, three points, and then Tim with two. Tim, right behind Tim with that. two. Yep. All right, all right. So here we go. Um, <laughs> Ninja fingers. <laughs> yes, very good. Here's your next one. Super easy one. Don't overthink it. Garrett jumps in there. Black sheep. Garrett has a point. Well done. Well done. All right. Here's here's the next one. A lot of a lot of uh, a lot of stairs here. Not. Not not guessing this one. All right, everybody going to give up on this one? This is another one of those disturbing nursery rhymes. Oh, who's got it? Who's got it? Jason? Ring around the rosies. Yes, pockets full of. I know roses. I don't I don't count, but I was just ashes ashes. We all <laughs> fall down. Like that's an awful awful nursery rhyme. If you know the story behind that. Um, so yeah, Jason barely edges out Allison there. All right, here we go. Here's the next one. Doc, Doc's got it. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. All right. And this one will be the last one. So we still have three, Allison. All right. Tim's got two. All right. So Tim, you get this one. It's all tied up. All right. And we'll have to send out two prize packs. Otherwise, Allison's going home with the prize. Okay. Here it is. Here's your last one. A little bit more difficult. Hey, fiddle, fiddle, or hey, diddle, diddle. All right, Tim, you got it. But we have a tie, three and three, Tim and Allison. Jason, you think we can send out two prize packs? That'd be cool. Could probably work that out. We can probably work that out. Awesome, awesome. So uh, if you are a winner, Tim and Allison, uh, make sure you jump in the private chat. 
<clears throat> with Jason and uh, make sure we have a, a good address that we can we can mail those uh, books to you and uh, we'll get those out to you. So nursery rhymes, as disturbing as some of them may be, uh, are important tools uh, for parents to have at their disposal. And uh, we as ministry leaders uh, need to be able to equip uh, parents with the tools that they need uh, to be successful. And uh, partnering with parents is such an important thing in disability ministry. Maybe sometimes one of the things that we take for granted because we're so um, so focused on programmatically and, and getting kids in and out of rooms and different things that sometimes we, we forget uh, about the parents. But uh, we just want to make sure, uh, especially now, as many churches across our country are opening, uh, I know that there are several states that have uh, had church services for a couple weeks now uh, already. So we want to make sure that we are equipping ministry leaders uh, to be able to partner with parents effectively, whether they're in church um, actively together or whether they are uh, still kind of in this lockdown status. So uh, the first part of this conversation, Wendy Wilkin from Traders Point is going to kind of talk us through what does it look like to partner with parents at church. Uh, the second half of the conversation is when I'm going to turn it over to you and we're going to learn from each other and talk about ideas on how we can partner with parents uh, during a global pandemic when we're not actively together. So, uh, Wendy, would you take a moment, uh, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, tell us a little bit uh, about Traders Point uh, Christian Church, and uh, we'll just let you take it from here. Awesome. Thanks. Hey guys, my name is Wendy, like Ryan said, and I'm on staff at Traders Point in Indianapolis, and I'm the special needs director um, in kids ministry. So my focus is in kids ministry, and I'm specifically at our Northwest campus. So we have six campuses, with Northwest being the largest one. Uh, so the kids ministers at the other campuses oversee special needs at their campuses with my direction and guidance. And then I also oversee our Bible study for adults with special needs called Be Known. And then we act also have an annual prom uh, that we do. So I oversee that as well. So one of my absolute favorite things to do as a special needs ministry leader is partner with parents. I just think we have such a unique opportunity to come alongside parents in this journey that they're on. Um, I for sure don't have it all figured out. Like I am not here to tell you how you need to partner with parents, um, but I can share what's worked well for me over the years um, and how I've been able to develop relationship with parents. Um, and I think there are two things that really make my perspective unique in that. Uh, first, before I came on staff at Traders Point, I taught special education in an elementary school for almost 10 years. Um, and there I realized after coming on staff at Traders Point that partnering with parents in a school is actually really hard. Uh, there were a lot of things that I couldn't say, um, things that I couldn't offer to parents and just walls that were being put up um, in between us that I didn't even realize until I came into ministry and was able to sit on the other side of the table with parents. Um, I've also made a lot of mistakes over the years. Um, having taught for almost 10 years and now being in ministry for seven, um, that's nearly two decades of making mistakes. Uh, times that I've said the wrong thing, that I've had the wrong attitude, that I've not sought Jesus um, before I had a conversation with a parent, and that list can go on. Uh, but I know that, and we all know, that we often learn best from our mistakes. But when we make mistakes in ministry, there's a real live person on the other side of that mistake. And I just don't want other people to have to make those mistakes. I want them to learn from my mistakes and what we've learned over the years at Traders Point. Cool. Thanks, Wendy. I appreciate you giving us a little intro uh, yeah. into you and, uh, and what you do there at Traders Point. Uh, so Wendy's going to break it down for us in three different uh, areas when it comes to partnering with parents in the church. Uh, the first is with families who are attending your church for the first time. Uh, and we know how important first impressions are. So uh, she's going to talk a little bit about that. The second area she's going to talk about, it's really hot topic. Uh, everybody needs help on this one is um, how to talk to current families uh, that are outside of your special needs ministry, uh, but probably would benefit from your special needs ministry. So that's, that's always a tough one. So I'm excited about that. Third area she's going to talk about 
uh, is maintaining relationships with current families in your special needs ministry. So, you know, those relationships that uh, we often probably take for granted and don't pour into a lot. So, uh, Wendy, why don't you talk to us first about uh, kind of your approach uh, to reaching out to those first time families that have come to Traders Point for the first time, maybe deer in the headlights. Uh, yeah. What's your approach there and in, in, in connecting with them? Yeah. So something I know I've found over the last seven years is that a lot of families who come to us because of our special needs ministry come to us with a lot of hurt uh, from other churches that they have either, we've had families who've been asked to leave their previous church because of their child's behavior. Um, parents who have been paged out of every service at church. Uh, we've had parents who've never attended church to, um, service together because there was no one to care for their child. So they each went to a different service. Um, and we've also had parents who weren't even given a chance. Like they walked up, said, hey, my son has autism and the church just stopped right there. Um, so that makes it really hard to partner with parents because they already have, you know, these walls and these hurts. And it um, means that we have to break them down and we have to do a lot to gain their trust. Uh, so the first thing that we do is we actually have six questions that we ask parents on that very first day that they show up. And this is for parents who just walk through our doors and we don't know they're coming. Um, and I think Jason's going to pop these six questions um, in the chat while, um, while I'm talking about them. But the first one we ask, and you can do this either just verbally or we, ha we have a sheet of paper too that we um, Ask, maybe ask parents to fill out. I often try and just do it verbally to actually have that conversation because conversation is better than writing on paper. Um, but I ask them if their child has any medical concerns or allergies. Um, and then we move to like, what are things that your child really loves? Um, and hopefully we have that thing in the building somewhere to where we can go grab it for them if it's not in the room. Um, and then we ask them, what does your child not like? Um, what are things that will really upset your child? How do we calm your child if they get upset? And then the last thing I ask is how long do you want us to wait before paging you? Um, I then explain to parents that for us, our goal is to never page a parent out of church um, and that we're equipped and ready to handle any behaviors that might come our way and that we're comfortable to wait as long as they're comfortable for us to wait. Um, and some parents are like, great, don't page me, take care of it. And some parents are, you know, if he's upset, if he, and so we just do whatever those parents want to do, especially on that first day. Um, and I've really watched parents' body language and facial expressions completely change when we ask these questions. I think it shows them that we thought of them ahead of time. Like we expected them to come and we're prepared for your child to be here and we want to know how to serve them best. Um, and I think it starts to build that trust um, with them. Um, at our Northwest campus where I'm at, we were able to install a two-way mirror in our special needs room. So that mirror looks into a um, resource room that's right next door where we just have supplies. So the kids just see a mirror and parents are able to look in and see what's going on. Um, I probably use it far more than any parents do. I really think I've only had one parent take me up on that offer in the last seven years to go look through that window. But most of them are pretty excited that we have it and think it's really cool that they can look in on their child and see how they're doing without interrupting their child. Cause you know, we all know children act differently when their parents are in the room. So they really wanna see, if they wanna see how they're doing that works well. Um, and then the final thing we do is we send an email to first time families with a child information sheet. Um, and in a second, Ryan's gonna screen share this child information sheet um, that we have. And so in this email, when we send it, um, it, for us, it, this is a link. Uh, so it's a digital, um, it's through like form stack. And so, but this is an old form that we've used before. Um, so in this email, we just send them more information about the church. And then we ask them to fill this out. And really it just expands on that information we found on the first day. And it gives us all the information that we're gonna need to be able to serve their child well. Um, one thing about this sheet that we get we've gotten several praises from parents over the years is the first thing we ask them after um, like basic information is 
list some of your child's gifts or talents. So really what we're, we're showing them is we see your child as a whole child and we know that they have strengths and they have things that make them shine. And we want to know what those are. Um, I think it just helps parents see that like we see your whole child and we don't see your child as a problem. We see them as a child of God. Uh, so that is something I would highly recommend if you do a sheet like this to the first thing you ask, be like, what are their strengths? What are they really good at? Hopefully everybody was able to see that. Uh, just a heads up as Ch Jason is um, adding some of those questions that Wendy mentioned in the chat. When we are done, we're actually gonna put a zip file together where you guys can download all these forms um, that Wendy has created um, for Traders Point and it, it works well for them. So I'd encourage you guys to make sure you grab those. Uh, we will also be dropping some links uh, into the chat section. Um, we have, uh, we also have a generic kind of info sheet that we created at Ability Ministry that churches can use. Um, but uh, yeah, feel free. Uh, Wendy's uh, info sheet uh, for Terry's Point is great. Asks a lot of good questions. So I'd encourage you guys uh, jump on the link that we just posted in the chat section and and grab that or grab the link off of our Ability Ministry page. That'll be there too. Um, so Wendy, that was awesome. Uh, I love I love that goal uh, that you mentioned. Uh, make it your goal to not page a parent. Um, and and I love what what she also said. You said uh, you want to be comfortable waiting as long as they're comfortable waiting. And I know sometimes that's hard as ministry leaders. Any of us that's you know sat uh, in a room uh, with a child that you know is just is just not having it on a given Sunday. It's, it's hard to not, you know, want to grab the phone. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I love, love that phrase. You know, we want to be comfortable with what the family's comfortable with. Um, so also if, if you've got questions uh, for one day, you, you can post those uh, in the chat section. You can wave your hand uh, as we kind of go through section by section here. Um, but I want to kind of, Throw to the next uh, section that Wendy's going to talk about. I think it's one of those uh, issues that we all encounter in ministry, and, and if we haven't, it's a guarantee that we will. Uh, it's when you uh, encounter a child, maybe that's mainstreamed in the children's ministry or youth ministry, uh, that you know would benefit from being in your special needs ministry, um, but they're not in the ministry and that's not on the family's radar. So what do you do? You know, how do you deal with that delicate situation. Uh, Wendy, drop some knowledge on us when it comes to handling that tough, tough situation. Oh man, I'm not sure that I'm going to do that introduction justice here, but I will certainly try. Um, you know, when first time families come, uh, we are, they're often looking for our special needs ministry. So they're aware that their child has um, some unique needs um, that needs to be in a unique location at our church. Uh, so I have found it way more difficult to talk to families who've been coming to our church for years, who now have a child that is either having some behavior struggles or we're noticing some developmental delays that are keeping that child from experiencing Jesus on a Sunday. Um, our goal as our kids ministry is that every child would experience Jesus on their level. And sometimes in that preschool room or that elementary room, that's just not the place for that child to be experiencing Jesus. And we need to have a conversation and having this conversation is hard and building this trust is probably the most difficult thing um, that I have found over the years. So there's some things that we've put in place at Traders Point that have started working better for us and have allowed us to um, start developing these relationships a little better. Um, so at our Northwest campus specifically, because that's where I'm located, I am never the first person to have a conversation with a parent. Um, I've trained our other staff members and key volunteers how to have these conversations um, because when I did have them, they did not go well, like at all. Um, and we realized, I realized one particular reason why um, over the years. So I can remember one conversation. It started off really well. I was talking to this mom and I was explaining about some of the attention and behaviors that uh, her son was having in the preschool classroom. In the middle of the conversation, she glanced down toward my name tag. And then as her eyes lifted up, I saw her body language change and her attitude toward me change. And what I think happened was she saw a special needs director. 
And her first thought was, oh my gosh, they're telling me my child has special needs, which then probably turned into, they're going to make him go to a special room. They're going to ask us to not come back. Um, Cause we did have a parent one time that her son hurt another child and we called them. And the first thing she said was, are you telling me I can't bring him back to church? And I was like, oh, you have, you know, something happened in your past to make you think that. So that was the last first conversation that I've had with a family. Um, and so what I do is train other staff members to do that. Uh, just because my title just, I think you know, there's just, unfortunately just these negative connotations with special needs. And so, um, I've even, when I'm the only staff member around to have a conversation, I've taken off my name tag, um, and just tell them, Hey, my name's Wendy and I'm on staff and kids ministry and just ignore, you know, what my title is, uh, because I'm not telling them anything that has to do with the title. I simply want to explain to them what happened that day. Um, I always come into conversations when needed and I'm always working behind the scenes. So when we have a preschool director, um, at, at our Northwest campus, when she's having these conversations, she wants guidance on how to have them or what to say, like, I'll tell her those things. And then when it gets to the point where she's developed that relationship enough with the parent and I need to come in to talk about a buddy or to talk about our special needs room, um, I can do that. And it just looks different than um, that first conversation. Um, the other thing that we have kind of changed to is the way we have conversations on Sundays. Uh, so we don't ever have a big conversation with a parent on a Sunday at, um, after church service without them knowing that it's going to happen. So we don't like spring the, Hey, we think your child needs a buddy on Sunday after church. Um, we always tell them if their child was struggling, right? If their child didn't sit at all at a center, like we're gonna give them that information. If they hurt another child, we're gonna talk to them about that. But I've trained our staff and key volunteers how to have that conversation in about 30 seconds. Um, and the goal in that is to make sure those parents are encouraged at the end of that. Um, and what we really do with that is it's almost following like the, you know, positive, negative type thing, um, or like the, the like sandwich of positive, make sure you start positive. Um, so we always tell them, uh, Hey, we loved having Johnny with us today. We noticed that he really loved our centers that we had. The Play-Doh one was really great for him, but we also noticed that in wiggle worship, Johnny didn't stand still and he really struggled to attend to the lesson in wiggle worship. But you know, we can't wait for him to come back. So it's simple. It gets to the point of like, hey, there was a little struggle today. Um, and the reason we do that is because we just don't know what a parent experienced in church just two minutes ago, right? Like they could have, for all we know, have given their life to Christ in that moment a few minutes ago. They could have made a decision for baptism. They could have been um, convicted of some sin in their life. Or heck, maybe they're just running off to lunch and their mind is not in this space. So we've just found those haven't gone well and they haven't helped us to build um, the trust in that relationship. So what we do then after that 30 second conversation is a staff member follows up with an email or a phone call during the week. And then we set a time for an in-person meeting to talk about you know, the need for a buddy or the need to change uh, that placement. I like that. I, I love that you've equipped your, your volunteers to, you know, give them the tools necessary. One of the other resources that you'll be able to grab um, with, with the links is um, Wendy's created a Sunday pickup conversation list. So her volunteers know how to communicate and uh, helpful tips, tips of what to say. Um, just like she said, you know, bathing everything in praise and positives. Um, so I would encourage you to grab that link. Um, and grab those resources so you can better equip your volunteers on how to handle um, some of those conversations. I also love that, uh, Wendy, you said, you know, you keep these conversations uh, outside of Sunday because Sundays are so chaotic. We all know that as ministry leaders, um, you know, at best you may get, you know, two, three minutes, you know, with a parent as they're coming and going in total. Um, so to be able to have a meaningful conversation uh, is, is really difficult. So I, I think that's that's great advice, Wendy. Now, this, this last section um, that we want to talk about is maintaining relationships with our current families. Because again, I think this is one of those areas um, where as ministry leaders, uh, we are guilty at times. 
of taking for granted those relationships. We know that they're there. We don't feel like we need to, you know, feed into them as much as the others because everything else is demanding our attention. So, Wendy, why don't you talk to us a little bit about maintaining uh, relationships with families uh, that are in our ministry already? Yeah. So one of the things that I do is I ask parents to update that child information sheet every year. Um, some of them don't fill it out. Some of them do, but I think it just lets them know like, Hey, we love your child and we want to keep serving them. And we know things change all the time. So if you can update this, it'll help us serve them uh, the best that we can. Um, because of my background in special education, I have offered to go to case conferences with parents um, or to walk them through a report that they've gotten from the schools. Um, so I'm lucky enough to be able to do that. And I've had several parents uh, take me up on that. But even if you don't have that background, I think even offering to, because parents can bring anyone that they want to a meeting. Um, and every time I've gone to one of those meetings, I've literally just sat in silence next to the parent. I was just like the, you know, cheering them on. So I think just offering to do that and even praying with them beforehand, you know, maybe if they don't want you there, you can be like, hey, can I call you right before and pray with you over the phone? Um, because those case conferences, especially the first one, if you happen to have a family who's just going through the process at the school, those are so intimidating. There are all these people with big names and big words um, telling you things about your child and they're really intimidating. So I think any way you can partner with parents through what they're doing at school um, is really helpful. Um, also, when we don't see a child in a month, volunteers send them a postcard. Uh, so this postcard simply says, hey, we miss you and we love you. Uh, we've had parents um, who say they've come back to church because of that postcard. Um, that one, they didn't realize it had been a month. You know, we all know how life gets that you just get crazy. Um, or two, they honestly didn't realize they would be missed. Um, we've, I had a parent say to me one time, this church is so big. How did you know we weren't here? And it's like, oh, because we're looking for you because we care about you. Um, so I think that helps. Uh, during this time of quarantine, I've been calling parents, like five to 10 parents every week, and just having a conversation with them. There's zero agenda to that conversation. It's just checking in. And those have been so great. I hope they've been just as great for the parents as they've been for me. But I plan to keep those up and try to have conversations with families outside, like Ryan said, of the two to three minutes that you get them on a Sunday, just to really find out what's going on in their lives. Um, I've also had parents, I offer every year to take parents to coffee or to lunch. Um, some parents completely ignore my request and I am totally okay with that because I don't want to be another thing on their, you know, to-do list. But there are some parents who want to do that. So I have a couple, a couple moms that we go to lunch and coffee often um, because they just want that relationship and they want to talk about their kid or just do other things. So that's been, um, that's been one of my favorite things and a great way to keep maintaining those relationships, that like simple gesture. Um, but like I said, I don't have all the answers to partnering with parents at all. I may not have even have taught you anything in this time. I don't know, but um, I hope that you at least gleaned one thing from it. But one thing that I have learned is that every parent wants to know that their child is loved by someone else, right? Like if I'm out with my kids and someone comes up and greets them and talks to my kids and doesn't even look at me, I'm completely bought in. Like you have won me over because you took care of my kids. And that's what I want to do with the parents that we serve at Trader's Point. Um, we have one family who's attended off and on over the years. Uh, they have twin boys with autism. Uh, the boys are probably 14 or 15 at this point, but they can be pretty aggressive um, and can easily hurt other kids and volunteers. Uh, after getting to know this mom pretty well, I've learned a lot about the hurt she experienced in previous churches. Um, like so much hurt, I'm surprised she's even still trying to go to church. Uh, that type of hurt. Um, but because of the great needs of her boys, there have been seasons over the years where we haven't been able to serve her family because we didn't have volunteers at the time who could safely take care of her boys, make sure they were safe, make sure the other kids were safe. So during one of these seasons when we hadn't seen them for a couple months be because we weren't able to take care of them, like I literally texted mom every week and was like, I'm sorry, we don't have anyone to serve your boys this weekend. I'm really sorry. Um, we got together for coffee during the school day. And let me tell you, I was a mess. I, 
literally cried while I was talking with this mom. Like she had to encourage me. Um, it was definitely not one of my finest moments as a ministry leader. Um, but what she said to me completely changed the way that I have done ministry since then. Um, so first she told me about a time that the volunteers at our church were serving with her boys. Um, and the volunteer simply said at the end, like, hey, we had a great time with your boys. We really love them and can't wait to see them again. And she told me that that was the first time anyone had ever said that to her about her boys. Like, ever. She'd never heard those words. Um, and that just, it brings me to tears now because I can picture her face and think about how I would feel if no one said to me like, hey, your daughter is great. I love her. She's adorable. Um, that would just break my heart. And then um, second, she told me that she's never had anyone work so hard to serve her boys, that no one had ever cried with her because they didn't get to serve her boys. Um, that the love that I was showing her and her two boys was all that mattered to her, that that meant more than anything we could actually do. Um, I knew right then, and I changed right then the way I would partner with parents, that I knew that the best thing that I could do to partner with parents was to welcome every child that walked through our doors and love them unconditionally. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> Wendy, Wendy, that's awesome. I, I wrote a little quote in the chat there. Uh, every parent wants to know their child is loved by someone else. And uh, that's powerful and so true. And uh, thank you for sharing that story um, at the end. You know, I, I think as ministry leaders, uh, the further we go along in ministry, if we haven't experienced that, we probably will, you know, experience a situation where uh, we don't have the volunteers or we don't have the staff that is equipped to handle the situation. Um, and to have that tough conversation uh, is, is probably one of the most difficult moments in ministry that we'll all experience. Um, but to be able to do that with love and uh, the fact that the, the mom, uh, she, she sensed you know, your love, your concern, your care, and the fact that you continued to follow up every week. It wasn't just like, hey, we don't have the people to help you, good luck. Uh, it was a weekly check-in uh, with, with the parents. So, that's super encouraging uh, to hear, and I think that's something that everybody, you know, needs to hear. Uh, and just the fact that every parent needs to know that their child is loved uh, by someone else is is a super powerful thing. So, uh, Wendy, thank you for sharing um, this this uh, this week on this topic on par partnering with parents. Uh, we know churches are back in session uh, all over our country, so this is a super important conversation. Uh, your forms are great. I really encourage people to, to jump on the links provided and download those forms and, uh, and utilize those. Check them against your current forms as ministry leaders. What do you need to add? What should, you, what should you subtract? I think there's a lot that we can learn from Wendy, and I'm thankful that she's been on today. I want to transition now, um, and I want to kind of turn, turn the forum over to you as ministry leaders, uh, because we know that not every church is back uh, meeting in person, and uh, some church, some states are, uh, you know, further along or further behind than other states. So let, let's shift the conversation now uh, to how do we partner with parents during a global pandemic when we're not seeing them on a weekly basis or even on a monthly basis because we know the church attendance is pretty scattered. Um, how do we partner with parents, or how have you? Uh, as ministry leaders been partnering with parents during this global pandemic, because I think we can all learn from each other. So go ahead and uh, unmute, and I'd love to hear from you what you've been doing. Um, I can share. So um, I've just been, just like Wendy said, I've been calling families during the week, and then also um, I FaceTimed every, like, not every single time, um, but FaceTimed a couple of times. Um, and the parents, I, it felt super awkward at first, but the parents actually followed up with me through the week and were like, wow, it was so good to see your face. And the kids maybe were on for like two seconds and then they're off running and doing their other thing. But 
it was encouraging and um, heartwarming for me to, to be able to just see the kids because we all really miss them. So that's something that I've been doing, which has been fun. And then sending notes in the mail. Yes, I, I don't think that we can, um, you know, we, we can't estimate the value of a handwritten note. You know, it is getting something in the mail uh, is so much more powerful than a text message because anybody can, you know, fire off one of those. It takes time and it takes money uh, to send something in the mail. And you're right, there's something about seeing somebody face to face that is just powerful. Um, my wife's a special education teacher and she does these Zoom meetings with her students and just to be able to see each other's faces is, is, is a powerful thing. So what else have you been doing as ministry leaders to partner with parents to connect with families and students during this uh, global pandemic? I'll go ahead, Joe. Uh, you know, we, we as well have also been calling families. Um, but one of the things we've done as well when talking to the families is um, just asking them how we can be praying for them and then actually sit right there and, and pray with them. And, and that's just made a huge impact for them. Um, but one of the things that, that was kind of a aha moment for me is as talking with one of, one of our, our parents, um, you know, and, and we're definitely not going through trying to do a check a list, just get everyone done. Um, but uh, one of the parents I talked to said um, they feel whenever there's a call, they feel, oh, it's just a check the list going through. Um, and so it's so it's so important. That's why you need to make it personal, find more things, you know, doing the prayer. And, and that removes that feel of check the list. Um, but where it really hit me between the eyes was um, those families that you don't reach, uh, where you leave a message. Um, and I've been guilty of that where, you know, so busy, you know, well, I left a message. I prayed for them even when I left the message. Um, but I may not circle, get time to circle back and call them again. Um, cause for, for me, I've, I've got over 900 families I'm ministering to. Um, so it, it's a significant list to, to try to get through to everyone. Um, but that, that's what hit me between the eyes is, oh, well, you're really, I, I really was just a check the list person if, if you just left a message and never turned back around. So that's one thing I would challenge everyone on if you do have to leave, leave a message, and apologize for my dog, um, but uh, if you do have to leave a, leave a message to circle back and, and actually try to, you know, make that second touch. Um, because even if you have to leave a message again, that that second touch point then does show them oh, okay i wasn't just a uh you know a checkbox um but what we've found is our our parents especially are so desperate for um other communication with adults because they've they've been so you know se segregated or separated from everyone else with the you know again i i've, I've been saying you know, I, I don't like saying the, the social distancing because we continue need to, to be social through all this. So I say physical distancing, um, but they're not having any chance to be social with anyone besides their kids. And, and then on top of it, if you've got a nonverbal child, it's just been miserable for them. Um, so we're actually in the process of creating virtual uh, uh, parent support groups where it's just going to be time for an hour through Zoom that we're going to get a bunch of parents together where they can talk with one another and just spend time um, probably at nine o'clock after kids go to bed uh, at night. And, and we're getting a lot of buy-in from parents that they're really wanting to do that and interested in doing that. Um, we'll have a moderator to make sure it doesn't get all, all negative because that's always the slippery slope um, with that. Um, but the, the big thing they're wanting is just, you know, having that, that support because, you know, many of the parents I'm talking with are and as well as many of the churches I'm talking with and assisting throughout the country, their, their families aren't sure when they want to come back to church. Um, so I, I think all of us are dealing with our families being slow and coming back. So that's going to be a way that we can at least keep the parents involved. As many of us are continuing to do ministry for the kids, we need to remember that the parents are a part of our ministry too. And, and that when we're doing disability ministry, that's for the entire family, not just the individual. So we've got to minister to the parents too. So that's how we're, we're doing is through the phone calls, the prayer, follow back up, and then starting to do the support groups. 
Lots of great uh, challenges and reminders, Doc. Appreciate you jumping in on that and appreciate the challenge of not treating people like a checkbox because uh, it, it can feel that way if you're running a large ministry and you've got a lot of contacts to make. Um, so yeah, thank you for that challenge. Also, yeah, this is the perfect time uh, if your ministry doesn't have parent support groups to launch those. Uh, I know that that was probably one of the last things that we did at First Christian Church when I was the leader there was to start kind of edging towards the, the parent support group things. Uh, but yeah, this is the perfect time to have that conversation. People are open and, and they want to do that. Um, I'm wondering if I could ask Tim to jump in here. Tim is uh, the disability uh, ministry uh, pastor at First Christian Church where I was uh, before coming on at Ability Ministry. Uh, he's got a large group, kind of like Doc has. And uh, Tim, I'm wondering if you could talk about kind of your strategy of breaking up, you know, making all of those contacts. Because I think you had a great strategy um, for making sure you reach all the people. Because I think with our um, online stuff that we do on Sunday morning, we're probably reaching, you know, 30 to 40 percent of our people, and which leaves, you know, up to 70 percent of our people that we're not touching through online. Uh, so talk just briefly about how you've kind of divvied up responsibilities. Uh, yeah, it was divide and conquer on our side of things. It was taking um, our group leaders, our volunteers, and set them into groups of, you know, 10 to 12 people. So, you know, we may have seven or eight groups that are uh, being connected every every week by that personal touch. And then as the ministry leader, what I try to do is I'll, I'll just go through and try to get uh, try to do the same thing um, but um, really it's been it's been it's a divide and conquer uh, so that uh, kind of do the big bigger group things uh, we we've been trying to do the um, uh, the zoom I call it prayer encouragement um, we do it on on Wednesdays and uh, to some success um, there's some weeks has been uh, better attended than others and I understand that um, but uh, we've been trying to do that uh, to, and, and I'm cheap. I, I, I only do like the 40 minute be, deal before it like times out. So uh, I, and I, and I, I, and I intentionally tell them, you know, we have this time frame. I know you guys are very busy. So, I, you know, here, no more than 40 minutes we'll be on here, but just a, just a time of um, uh, just, you know, asking stupid, would you rather questions, just something to have fun a little bit, have a little uh, time to, um, uh, get in the word and then just what's on their heart, what they, what they need prayer for. Um, actually even had a counselor find out about our ministry uh, who, who works locally. And so she jumps on once a month now and she, she's the professional. I'm, you know, I don't, I can listen to counseling and shake my head a lot, but she actually knows what she's talking about. So I uh, have her uh, uh, come on and, and really give some good answers uh, to things. Um, uh, but as far as uh, any other things we're doing right now, um, I know the handwritten thing is great. I can't, I, I, I make my postcards and everything and I'll, I'll sign it and then I'll, I'll hand, hand uh, address them. Um, and by that point, I feel like the carpet tunnel is set in. So I, I wish I was a lot better about <laughs> handwriting them, but I do, I, we try to about every other week, try to do the whole uh, postcard thing. I try to send out every Monday a devotion thought. And sometimes my devotion thought becomes a devotion sermon, but it's uh, uh, just some things that I come to think about and I think, well, you know what, if they can get this on a Monday and feel encouraged somehow that can springboard them into the next week or give them some sense of, okay, I can make it through, then, then, then you know, good with that too. So we try to hit several different methods, but as far as phone calls, um, yeah, we, we really try to divide it up uh, and so that they get the same person that's, that, that's connecting with them uh, on a on a weekly basis, and then if I can jump in and get in with them every so often, uh, then then that's a that's a bonus too. But um, uh, that's that's a little bit of what we're trying to do here, other than trying to clean up Ryan's mess from uh, when he was doing ministry here. No, just teasing. <laughs> yeah, I was I was going to actually ask uh, Ryan if if my uh, prize could be hand delivered to me. That that would be uh, that'd be fantastic. You know what? I I think I can do that. I think I can do that. So, or seven what people? Maybe I can I can solve your uh, your HVAC problems too. So. <laughs> Would you please? I'm sweating over <laughs> here. <laughs> so so yeah. No, thank you, Tim, for for jumping in. 
<clears throat> I think he he gives us um, a good reminder whether we're uh, in person or we're you know separated because of this uh, pandemic. Uh, delegate, delegate, delegate. You have ministry teams, you have volunteers. Whether you have two volunteers or twenty volunteers, uh, the more you give them, the more empowered they will be, and the better your ministry will be. Uh, I would like to give maybe one more opportunity for somebody to jump in to share something that they have done or seen work. Uh, as far as reaching out to families uh, during this time of separation. And then I'm going to wrap up and kind of give a preview of our next meeting. Going once, going twice. All right, sold. Hey, lots of good ideas here. Wendy, thank you again for uh, sharing with us especially those forms. I know as a ministry leader uh, doing uh, ministry in a large church, having, having the paperwork is sometimes a daunting thing uh, for people. So a lot of great tips there. Again, grab those uh, off the links in the chat. We'll also post this video uh, at some point next week for anybody that didn't see it, or if you want to go back and rewatch it to grab something uh, that maybe you missed or an idea that was shared, uh, we'll be posting that online next week. Our next gathering, uh, we do this on second and fourth Thursdays of each month at noon Eastern. Um, so that would be June the 11th. Uh, we will be having Jess Berryhill uh, on with us and she will be talking about how to connect your disability community to your disability ministry because they're not always connected, right? You can have a great disability ministry and not be very well connected to your community. So she's gonna talk about strategies on getting connected in your community, uh, both during regular life that we used to have and during this time of separation because of the coronavirus. Thank you everybody for tuning in uh, to this, partnering with parents uh, with Wendy Wilkin and Ability Ministry. Uh, I'm glad that everyone has joined in. Hopefully uh, you had a little fun and uh, hopefully you gained some new knowledge that will better equip you uh, to do ministry in the future. Check back with us on June 11th. Uh, yes, also Garrett just said, great job, Wendy. I second that. And, uh, thanks, Wendy from Allison. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we will see you next time.